All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. I um, hope you can all hear me loud and clear. My name is Emma, and I'm here with Exago. Um, we are going to get started at about 11.02. I just wanted to let you know that we are here and ready. Um, so there's some names still still checking in here, so we're just waiting for, uh, for everybody to get in and get settled. So we will aim to get started, as I said, at about 11.02. All right. Hello, everybody. It's just about 11.02. My name is Nick Cortina. We're here uh, with Exago to do a support lab on custom functions. Uh, before we get started, I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me okay. So if you guys can just go ahead and type either a Y or a yes into that questions pane there. And it looks like I'm already getting some coming through, so it looks like we should be just about good. Thank you, everyone. Um, again, my name is Nick Cortina, where we've got some fun stuff regarding custom functions for you folks today. Um, and again, these labs are meant to be very interactive, so as we're going through, please feel free to post questions in that chat. We've got a couple of folks on our side monitoring to make sure that we get some answers for you guys, and if there are some that seem to be applicable to the group, we'll answer those sort of on the fly here as well. The final note that I do just want to mention about today's lab is that it is going to be fairly code heavy. So custom functions by nature are us writing high level code to be used within the Exago interface. Um, so I just want everybody to be totally aware we are going to be looking at a, a good amount of code today. So, you know, just be, be ready for that as we go forward here. So all that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So as I just mentioned, custom functions are a way for us to add more functionality to the Exago use, uh, user interface, specifically within our formula builder. So going through here today, we're going to take a look at a couple different custom functions that we've developed here at Exago, and all of these are going to be available on our support site so that if you'd like to just go and pull that code, you certainly will be able to. To touch briefly on what we're going to be talking about for each of these various functions, the first is going to be export type. 
And this is a custom function that we've seen in some of the labs that we've previously done. Um, and we figure we're going to start with this one as sort of our basic example to kind of dive right into how do we make a simple custom function. So here we're going to talk a little bit about the custom function structure. We're also going to touch on the session info object, which has a lot of power and capability to it. And we'll, we'll kind of get into that in just a minute here. The second function we're going to look at today is called dynamic logo. Uh, and what this one's going to do for us is dynamically decide which company logo to pull on a report based on the company ID value of the user that logged in and ran that report. And so we're going to see exactly how we're pulling some of those logos from our file system. And we'll also see how we can create some cell text within the formula to then be, or excuse me, within the function to then be referenced as a formula within Exaco. Finally, we're going to use this getVAT function here. And so for those of you who may be unfamiliar, VAT stands for value added tax. And for countries in Europe, this is sort of a kind of synonymous to sales tax, if you will, in the United States. So we're going to see how we can ping an external API uh, over the internet here to get some of those VAT rates for a couple different countries. Uh, and then do some custom calculations based on what those rates are. We're also going to see here that we can do something kind of interesting and reference our own custom error messages. So the, the given example we'll take a look at will show us exactly how we can handle uh, a user maybe entering something erroneous for one of our function arguments there. So on that note, I'm going to go hop over to our demo application here. And I'm going to dive into my lab content folder and I'm going to open up this export type function so we can take a quick look at what's going on and then take a look at some report output. So here we can see that we've got some basic employee information. We can see that we're calculating some revenue numbers here and then we're going to chart that information as well. Now, I think the key thing that I'd like to, to show to you guys here is that we're using a lot of conditional formatting. We can see that by these little, uh, these little A icons here. So if I click into one of these, we're going to see that we're conditionally choosing to suppress rows. And diving into the actual function here, we can see we're using the export type function. And we're going to say that if this isn't HTML, so if we're not trying to run this report in HTML, we're not going to display that chart. Additionally, looking at some of the rows above here, we can see that we're doing something that's almost identical, except this time we're going to suppress if it is going to HTML. So effectively, what we're going to be doing is showing our chart if we're in an in interactive HTML and showing our tabular information if we're in any other export type. So we'll go ahead and execute this report. And as this goes out to our interactive HTML, we can go ahead and see just the chart being displayed. And if we were to go ahead and execute this as a PDF, we're going to now see just the tabular information coming through. And if I scroll all the way to the bottom here, we can see that chart doesn't show up. And again, this should seem pretty familiar for any of you folks who were here for what I believe was our conditional formatting lab just a little while ago. So we know what the function does, and that's great. But let's take a look over at our admin console here to see exactly what's going on and how we implement this custom function. So here on my left hand side, you can see that I've got a whole host of these guys that, that we've been cooking up and working on here right now to add a new custom function. We simply right click on our functions here and we'll click add. And this will open up a brand new screen for us. We can see it's just a new custom function and it's sort of a blank template for us to fill out. Now, in this instance, I've already got this export type function built. So let's go ahead and take a look here. We've got our name export type and we could see that that's going to be synonymous with what we see when we go to actually use the function within the formula builder in Exago. The next piece here is our description. Now you'll notice that here I don't actually have a description for this function set just yet. So in this instance, it might make sense for me to add a description here, something like 
returns the given export type of the report. And these descriptions are going to show up in the formula editor when we go and select a given function for use to build those formulas. So the description is a nice way to give a simple message to let the user know what that function is going to actually be doing. For this export type function, we don't actually need any user input. So there's not going to be a minimum or maximum number of arguments. And our category here is going to be other. And this is what determines where this function actually lives as far as the formula builder is concerned. And because this is returning the export type, looking at these categories, I think it makes the most sense to leave this in that other category. Down here, we can see that our language is C Sharp, and we do have the option to code in either C Sharp, JavaScript, or Visual Basic here. And in this instance, we don't need any references or namespaces. And we just have one simple line of code here. And so this is going to bring us to the next point I want to touch on, and that's going to be this session info object. So here we can see that we're using some of the information in session info, specifically our report component, to tell us what the export type is when we go and actually execute that report. And as we saw in our uh, report here, our report editor, excuse me, that return is going to look something like this. It'll either say HTML or something like PDF or Excel or CSV or what have you. And so we can use that to conditionally decide whether or not we want to show different components of a different report. Now, I am just going to hop over to our support site here because we have this article on session info and Emma should have just been dropping that into the webinar chat so that you guys can all take a look at that if you'd like. But we can see here that within session info, we're going to have access to a couple different pieces here that we can use if we'd like to modify different things via custom functions. And so here we can see that we've got a lot of report information here. So if we did need to dig into any of the data objects on a report or, or something like that, we could certainly do that here. We can even potentially look at some of the setup data pieces here as well. And that's going to give us some other information, things like parameters, again, some of those data objects, joins, roles, et cetera. And session info will really give us a lot of power by allowing us to access those user IDs and company IDs as well. We're going to see this in the dynamic logo example that we'll be getting into in just a minute. So at this point, I'm going to pause for just a minute. I know that this one is uh, a little bit of review since we have seen this function already, but I just want to make sure that we're, we're hitting all questions and make sure that we're OK there. And it looks like we are currently OK. Um, and so if that's the case, I'm going to hop into our next example here. So opening up this next report called Dynamic Logo, we can see that we've got some, some order information here for different customers, and that's all, all fine and good. But what I'd like to direct your attention to is the function call in cell A1, my logo. And again, we're, we're calling it dynamic logo here. The way that I've named it as far as the naming convention here is my logo. Um, again, that's just going to be up to you folks when you implement what you put in that little name tab there. If we look in our actual formula editor, we can see in our other here that we've got this called my logo. And so running this report, I'm currently logged in as this Nick C user. We can see the little Exago logos appearing here for us. And looking at our sample code, we can see that the company ID parameter value that was set is Exago. So because I logged in as a user from Exago, we see the Exago logo appearing here. And that's great. But let's go ahead and log in as somebody different. Maybe. Luke Skywalker from the Rebel Alliance. So if Luke is going in and he wants to go and take a look to see how sales are doing with the Rebels, he can go ahead and again launch that dynamic logo report. 
And now this time we're going to go ahead and get the Rebel Alliance logo. And we can see in our sample code here that the company ID value that was just passed in is the Rebel Alliance. So we see some output here. Let's go ahead and hop into the admin console again and take a look at what that code is actually doing. So here we can see the name of that function, again, my logo. Our description here loads your company logo, fairly simple, right? Again, there's no arguments for this uh, function here, so we're gonna have both our minimum and maximum number of arguments set to zero. And again, I think the category here makes the most sense to sort of keep that in other. Looking down a little further, we're still writing this function in C sharp. No references once again, but this time we're going to use this namespace web reports API dot reports. So looking at some of the code here, the first thing we're going to do is get that company ID value from session info. And because company ID is one of the internal parameters used within Exago, we can access it directly from session info using the call as we see here. The next piece we're going to do here is format that company ID into the image name. So all of our image names that we're using for those different logos are going to follow this same naming convention, logo underscore the company name dot PNG. The next piece we're gonna do here is create the actual text for the formula that we're going to push to that cell. And here what we're really doing is using a string dot format to take the image name that we created on line five here and push that into a call to the base exago function load image. And what our load image function does by default is goes and takes the name of an image that you give it, finds said image and displays it on our report. So really what the dynamic logo function is doing is using load image and dynamically deciding which logo to uh, call load image on by that company ID value. Now, one note, this example uses the load image prefix setting in our admin console. And so looking at our general settings here in the other settings category, we can see this load image cell function parameter prefix. And this is where we specify the path for those images that we then want to be able to go and pull. So in this instance, this is gonna be that uploaded images folder on my machine. And going into here, we can see that we've got some of those logos here ready for us to pull, depending on which user logs in. And again, they're all following that same naming convention of logo underscore and then the company name. Navigating back to our code, we could also modify this if we wanted so that we wouldn't need to use the load image prefix setting. And the way we would do that is simply include the fully qualified path before the actual image name here on line five. After we've got the call to load image formatted in our formula text string, we're going to make a call here to create the actual formula to push into that cell. And again, in order to do that, we're doing a call to create formula. And this is a basic Zago uh, function here, excuse me, I should say base function for the actual back end of Exago, if you will. And so this function is going to need to take the page info from session info, the text for the formula, which is that string we created here on line eight, and then we've got our cell variable collection filter, which is really just an enumerator, and we use data field to say that this is just going to be a standard exago function. Finally, we're going to return that formula we created and tell it to evaluate. 
And what that'll do is take that cell that we created and pushed our new formula into and evaluate it the same way we would any other Exago formula that we created from within the UI. So again, I'm gonna pause for a minute here and make sure that there's no questions and make sure everyone's uh, feeling okay with everything we've mentioned so far. And it looks like we're still going all right here. So I'm going to hop back over and um, unfortunately, Luke is done for the day, so we're going to log back in as my standard login here. And so going back into my lab content folder, the last report I want to show you guys is this VAT report. And before we run this, I just want to explain a couple of the different pieces here so we have some idea of what we're looking at before we see that output. So here in our page header for the United Kingdom, Germany, and Spain, I'm making a call to our get VAT function, and I'm giving it each of the respective country codes here. And what this will do is return the current VAT rate for each of those respective countries. The next call I'm making in my page header here you can see that I've boxed this in and I've done that intentionally because I want to highlight that this call to get VAT is going to return an error message and not just any error message but one that I've actually defined and included in my language files and we're going to see exactly how to do that in just a minute. Finally down here we can see that we've got this footer on our product name so for each product, we're going to show that unit price, and then we're going to calculate what that unit price would be in the UK, in Germany, as well as in Spain. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and execute this report. And again, I mentioned this at the beginning of the webinar, but each of these calls to get VAT are actually going to be pinging an external web API to get those value added tax rates. And here we can see as our output is beginning to be rendered that the current VAT rates for the UK are 20, for Germany is 19, and for Spain is 21. We can see the converted amounts for each of these various products. And finally, in our uh, special call up here, we can see that there's a custom error message being returned, and it's telling us that there was an invalid numeric value detected. Check the input value of your amount. And if we go ahead and look at the actual uh, call to the function here, we can see that we're, uh, we're trying to get the value for Spain, which is valid, but the actual amount that we're sending this isn't a real uh, numeric amount. 4.A doesn't necessarily make sense to that online API, right? So on that note, let's take a look at exactly how, how this function is coded and where all, this, all, all these various pieces are actually coming from. So I'm going to go back to our admin console here. And I'm jumping over to our get VAT function. And so here we can see that our name is get VAT. Our description is call with country code for VAT rates, call with country code and value for converted amount. We've got our minimum number of arguments set to one. And that's because if we call this function with just one argument being a country code, we'll just get the rate. And our max arguments is two. And that means that we can, again, call it with just one argument to get the rate, but we could also call this function with a country code and a given amount value to instead simply go and convert that amount for us. This particular function probably makes the most sense in the financial category. And starting to look down at the, the bottom box here, we can see that we've got references to system DLL, system web extensions DLL, and MS Core lib DLL. And we've also got some namespaces that we're referencing as well. Jumping down into the code, 
we can see that we're creating a, a slew of our variables here for use at different times in the function. And the first thing that we're going to do is actually take that first argument convert it to a string and make it uppercase so that it matches the format we want to use when we call the web-based API. Here, we're going to check if our argument length is one, and if it is, we're simply looking to get that rate. And so here we'll be setting the property value to be standard rate, and we'll see exactly why we're doing this in just a minute. The next thing we do is check to see if our args length is two. And if it is, what we're gonna do is try and parse the second argument as a double. And if we can't, we're gonna return this custom error message, CF invalid number. And so in order to include this custom error message, I'm gonna go and open up my local files to get to where the Exago installation we're using is located. And within the Exago installation, in my config folder, and then languages, we can see that I've actually got this CF errors XML document here. Now, with this document open, we can see that I've created additional language elements here and we can see the particular one I'm using, CF invalid number. And that uh, error language text here is invalid numeric value detected. Check the input value of your amount. And that's exactly what we saw on the report when we just ran it before. Now, again, our language files here follow what we call a, a cascading format similar to CSS sheets for those of you who might be familiar. And if we go into our main settings, we can see our language files here. And so those sort of take effect one after the other there. And so by adding in that CF invalid number to this custom language file that we then include, we can reference this error within that function to pull it up when we get the case that a user enters in an invalid number amount there. Again, if we have two arguments here, the property that we want returned isn't going to be the standard rate anymore, but the actual result of the calculation. And so at this point, we're getting to where we're actually going to format our URL here with this string. And we can see that I've got this, uh, this little URL here. And this is just a simple online API that will get those VAT rates and perform this calculation for us. And here we can see that we're going to push the country code into the first position here and then move the actual amount value into the second position. So to give you guys an idea of what that's actually going to do, here we can see that URL, and I've used Germany's country code here, and a value amount of 70. And here we can see that this returns a simple JSON packet that gives us our result, the VAT that was applied, and the standard rate for that actual VAT. So when this JSON's returned to us, we actually have to go and use this web client to download that string from the URL, and that will be stored in this response string variable. We'll then use a JavaScript serializer to take that response string and push it into this JSON dictionary that we made on line 31 here. Once the Java's, or excuse me, once the JSON has been serialized, we can go and get the specific property that we're looking for. And if that argument length is one, that's just going to be the standard rate because we were just going to be looking for that actual VAT value. If we have two arguments, that's going to be the result. 
which is the actual converted amount that we saw in the packet here. And again, looking at our output here, we can see that a single call is simply going to go and get that actual VAT value for whatever given country. And calls with those two arguments here are going to go to any specific country and convert the actual amount that we input. So I'm going to pause here for just a minute and make sure that we're, we're all good with questions and make sure that, uh, that everyone's feeling okay. Um, and this is going to be the last example that we're showing today. So I do just want to mention um, that all of these functions are going to be up on our support site. And when we post the recording for this lab, we'll have all of the links to those specific articles along with the recording on one page so that it's all easy for you folks to sort of go and, and pull whatever you'd like there. So it looks like we're doing pretty okay on questions for now. So I do just want to thank everyone for coming. And the next lab that we're going to be doing is going to be in early August on ExpressView and visualizations within ExpressView, how to create them, display them, and, and all the different use cases we have there. Um, so thank you all for coming. We're going to stick around for a couple more minutes, make sure we, we handle any more questions that do come in. But uh, thank you all so much, and happy reporting.